Y'all yeah, are so quiet. Do you? It, it's almost six o'clock. You want to start early? Maybe he'll finish early. <laughs> <laughs> How y'all doing? Great. It's good to see y'all. Let's sing a little bit. Oh, worship the King. from Psalm 24. It says, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend into the, he the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, even Jacob. Lift up your hands, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that, it, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your hands, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of Glory. Amen. I want to welcome you to our service tonight, and um, I pray that tonight would be completely focused on giving that King of Glory all of the glory and honor and praise that he deserves. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your glory. We thank you for your might, God. Um, we just thank you for another opportunity to come to this place and to lift you higher. I pray that you would be our focus tonight, and that as we leave this place, um, to serve you throughout our week, God, that um, we would just 
be humble and obedient servants to share you in our lives this week, God. We love you and we thank you for all of your many blessings. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Andrew. There's a fountain filled with blood.
right. Well, good evening, everybody. <laughs> okay. That was pretty lame, but that's okay. First Peter chapter 2. Let's look at... Uh, Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's see what's going on here. This is the uh, passage that was right after last week's. Can you imagine that? It's doing something a little different this week. It's going to go in order. Chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Interesting passage. Uh, sermon title this evening is, is Godly Living, and hopefully, prayerfully, we will understand this passage just a little bit better uh, when we get done. In one important aspect or respect to today's culture and the culture of what's going on here in First Peter is, is that unbelievers from all areas, all corners of our world, constantly attack Christianity. Constantly attack Christianity. They did that back in, in Peter's day. Obviously, they're going through a, 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 a huge issue, a huge turmoil, huge persecution. Uh, they do that today, constantly attacking and criticizing Christianity. Christian apologist Wilbur M. Smith, at the end of World War II, correctly observed that the world has opposed Christianity ever since Jesus' day, and believers should not expect things to be different today. It, it only gets worse, right? It doesn't get any better. It, it tends to get worse. The 19th century Scottish preacher Alexander McLaren, he commented and he said this, The world takes its notions of God, most of all, from the people who say that they belong to God's family. They read us a great deal more than they read the Bible. They see us, they only hear about Jesus Christ. Interesting how our lives can point people to Christ or point them to the world. What is it that we talk about? What is it that we, we uh, discuss when we are with our friends and our family? Are we talking about the latest thing on the news? Or are we talking about how great God is and what He has done for you in your life and the promises that we find in His Word of God? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told all who would seriously follow Him. In Matthew 5, 16, He said, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And again, that, that's really the essence of what Peter is talking about here tonight in this passage. He is, he is exhorting his readers and us to live godly lives, that our lives would point people to Christ, not that they would point them away from Christ. We can say a lot of things without actually ever saying a word. And what are we communicating to people? Are we communicating that we are followers of Jesus Christ, that, that we go to church and we never talk about God and never turn to God again? Or do we live and breathe a relationship with Jesus Christ? Verse 11 uh, starts off, great, uh, great word, I, I, I love it. It says, beloved, beloved. As Christians, we must constantly remind ourselves of who we are in Christ, who, who we are, that, that we are bought and paid for with a price, the price of Jesus Christ's blood. We are beloved. He's, he, he says this here, obviously, in verse 11, but he says this seven other times in 1 Peter and 2 Peter. He is telling us how much God loves us. Remember what's going on in, in, in 1 Peter, uh, the persecution from Nero. Uh, they, are, they are exiled out of their homes, took nothing with them, uh, probably, most of them. And so they are completely exiled. They're wondering, is God still on the throne? Is God still in charge? Uh, they are, have a lot of questions. And Peter, eight times in, in 1 and 2 Peter, exhorts them that says, God loves you and you are the children of God. Nothing, nothing has changed. No matter how much persecution comes from Nero, no matter how much persecution comes from this world, God still died a death. You are still bought with a price. You are still redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so he points them back to that and re-shifts their focus. 
don't know about you guys, but the last couple of weeks have been grueling weeks. They've been grueling weeks for me uh, and for our church family. Uh, they, they have just been grueling. And, and I loved how, how we read or, or just sung from Sweet Hour of Prayer. And, and uh, I'll reread it to you here. It says, in seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter snare by our return to the sweet hour of prayer. You know, that you and I would come back to our Heavenly Father for rejuvenation, that we would seek Him and, and His love for you and for me, and we would be recharged by our relationship with Jesus Christ. So again, eight times in his two epistles, Peter reminds his readers of God's love for them. And because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we are accepted in part of the beloved that we see here in verse 11. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the beloved. That is us. That, that, that we are loved. When the entire world turns against us, when our own family turns against us, our friends, uh, everything that we thought we understood to be true is no longer true. We know that Jesus Christ loves us. We are loved by our Heavenly Father. And if there is no one else who loves us, that's enough. That's enough to be loved by our Heavenly Father. And so uh, this great passage begins with this idea that we are loved, that we are cared for, that we are or have uh, everlasting life in Jesus Christ. He goes on, he says, not only beloved, but he says, I urge you, I, I, I urge you. It's the same word we see in Romans 12, 1. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. He is literally telling them that I am urging you to do something. You need to do this. If you are going to succeed as a Christian, as living as a Christian, then you need to adhere to what I'm about to say. You need to adhere to, to what's going on in, in this word. Peter is urging them and us to reciprocate God's love by living for him that you and I would live for Christ. We talked about that this morning, that it's not about works for salvation. Absolutely not. It's 100% it's the opposite. But what we have is a byproduct of our faith in Jesus Christ is works, is works, and that we love him. And so what we see is that you and I are reciprocating God's love by living for him. Now, that looks different in everybody's walk, and I understand that completely, but we all have the same uh, goal, the same mission, should be, that, that we would live a life that people would want to come to Christ. They'd want to come to Christ because we look different than the world. We offer something that non-believers don't have. We offer the love of Jesus Christ. Unsacrificial love of Jesus Christ. He says, Beloved, I urge you. And then he says, as aliens and strangers. We'll take those one at a time. Aliens is any person who lives in a country not his own. So that is an alien. This is a simple yet profound reminder for you and I. That, that we truly, this is not our home. That this is not, this is not why we have breath in our lungs. It's so that we can partake of McDonald's, Right? even though that's a great thing and it's a good byproduct of living in this world, right? But that's not what we're here. Who doesn't like McDonald's? Are you? Come on! Chick-fil-A? Can we go Chick-fil-A? All right, we'll go Chick-fil-A then. All right, we'll go Chick-fil-A. It's a great byproduct of living in this world to eat on Chick-fil-A, but that is not really what we're here for. Right? That, that's not why we have breath in our lungs. We have breath in our lungs in order that we may glorify our Father who is in heaven. Right? That, that's why we have this, this uh, breath in our lungs. That's why we exist. And so this profound reminder of the word alien is to bring us back instantaneously to the right view of the world. Or it should. Bring us into a right view of the world. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, 
from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, we are not to be of this world. We're to be in this world, but not of this world. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And if we're going to be honest with one another, some of us would say that we have been conformed by the world. If we're going to be honest with one another, we would say, yes, unfortunately, in areas of our life, we have been conformed to the world. And so how do we, how do we get out of that? How do we go back? Well, we, we get back into the Word of God. We get back into the sweet hour of prayer. We begin to refocus our attention to know that we are aliens, that this is not why we are here. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We think about this passage. We dissect this passage to its nth degree, and, and, and we have, actually. Have we not, Andy? Say yes. Okay, great, because you preached it. So, okay, great. All right. So, uh, so b- this is a great passage, though. It says that, that we are not to love the world or the things in the world. And yet, again, if we're honest with one another, that, that we have fallen trap into this, that we, we have been led into this trap before. Currently, some of us may be in this trap. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the, it's from the world, right? It's from the world. The world is passing away, and all is lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. He lives forever. And that is an amazing passage. Uh, there are tons more uh, passages of Scripture that would tell us that we are aliens and we're not to be part of the world um, or be conformed to the world. Mark 4, 19, I'll read them very fast. John 12, 25, John chapter 15, verse 19, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, James chapter 1, verse 27, 1 John chapter 5, 4. I could go on, I won't, but you get the idea. Right, that, that the New Testament is full, full of scriptures and passages that tell us that we are not to be conformed to this world, that, that we are here as aliens in order that we may be the gospel. All right, be the gospel. So he says, we're aliens, which should automatically bring us refocused into the citizenship is in heaven, not on uh, this planet, not, a, not, an, not of, of earth. And so then he says, and strangers. So the King, King James Version says, Pilgrim, all right, so strangers, pilgrim, refers to a visitor who travels through a country. We are just traveling through, right? We are just have a short stop on this planet that some of us would like it to be a little shorter. Some of us would like it to be a little longer, but we are here just for a short period in order that we may have everlasting life with Jesus in heaven, right? And so we are literally strangers, or we should be living as strangers. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 14. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. We're seeking the city which is to come. And so we ask ourselves for a moment this evening, which city are we living for? And then obviously we're in church on a Sunday night. And so the answer would be, we're obviously living for God's kingdom. We're, we're living for the, the city to come. And then let's actually look in our lives, let's inventory our lives, and let's see what, what does that actually show. Does that show that we are living for a city which is to come? Or are we living for a city that is here and now? Hebrews chapter 11. Great passage. Obviously, we'll be dissecting that over the next several years. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16 says this, All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. 
Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. He's prepared a city for us as followers of God. And yet we constantly fall into the trap of living for the things of this world instead of the things of the world to come. He says that, that beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers, he says, to abstain from fleshly lusts. Abstain from fle fleshly lusts, which, which we, again, find ourselves in all the time. I'll give you a list of those here in just a few moments. Uh, as a matter of fact, you guys can go ahead and start turning to Galatians chapter 5 because we're going to spend some time in Galatians chapter 5 uh, this evening. But abstain from fleshly lust. We are not of this world, and therefore we are to abstain from the lust of the flesh because the flesh is of this world. All right, So we're to abstain from those because we are above that. We should be. Uh, so the command to abstain signifies that saints do have the ability by the new life and the indwelling of the Spirit to restrain the lustful flesh, even in a postmodern culture dominated by sensuality and immorality. How, how, do we, how do we achieve that? How do we achieve this passage that says that we are to abstain from fleshly lust? Well, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to walk through that ever so quickly. Everybody there? Everybody good? Whoever wanted to turn, brought your Bible, you're there. All right, here we go. Galatians chapter 5, picking up in verse 13. For you are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Serve one another. We are called literally into freedom. And that freedom says that we are free from the sinful lust, the sinful pleasures of this world. Remember, we are a new creation. We are a new creature in Christ. The old has gone. Behold, the new has come. Right? We are a, a new creation. And that new creation tells us that we are called to freedom and that we are not to turn our freedom into an opportunity for sinful living for the flesh, but that we are to use it that we may love other people, show love for one another. And then verses 16 and 17. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. How is it that you and I can actually achieve abstaining from the lust of the flesh? It says right here in verse, uh, verse 16, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Verse 17. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. You see, our lives are this opposing force. We have the, the flesh and the spirit constantly battling each other in a war, this word tells us in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. He tells us that this literally is waging war against the soul. Waging war literally is the idea that, that this is a civil war. This is a civil war going on inside of us each and every day of our life. The flesh battling the spirit back and forth, back and forth. And how is it that the spirit is able to win over the flesh? It says that we walk in the spirit. We feed the spirit more than we feed the flesh. Here's the list that everybody's been so anxiously waiting for. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, those are the, the, the desires of the flesh that we're talking about here in, in 1 Peter. But literally is this war that is waging inside of us. It's a strong term, literally, that, that, that means to carry out this long-term military campaign long-term military campaign that never ceases. 
It is this idea of a, a war that goes on until basically until our, our death because we are battling flesh and the spirit every single moment of every single day. It takes place in the soul. Again, it's a civil war. Romans 7, 14 and 15 says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. How many of us fit this criteria at moments in our life? This is a constant battle, constant battle. You may win tomorrow and lose, or you may win today and lose tomorrow, but what we need to do is stay focused upon the power of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit that is residing within each and every one of us. He says in verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Um. Before I do that, let me read James chapter 1. Let me read James chapter 1, verses 13, 14, and 15, just very quickly, and then I'll move on to verse 12. Let no one say he is tempted. I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. We are in a constant war. Flesh against spirit. Verse 12, he says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. You and I are called to something far greater than what this world has to offer. You and I are, are called to things that are, that are greater than this world. We are called to be... Well, we are called to have the fruits of the Spirit. We are called to have the opposite of, of the lustful sins, but we are called to have love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and gentleness and self-control. We're to have all of these things because they come from the power of the Holy Spirit that resides within each and every believer. And he says that that is our behavior, that it is to be excellent among the Gentiles, among the, the lost world among those who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They may look at us and say, we are different. Why are you different? Why are you calm in the midst of the storm? Why are you able to walk through the valleys and still have a semi-smile upon your face? Because the joy of the Lord surpasses all understanding. You see, it is the fruits of the Spirit, fruits of the Spirit that help us. He says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers. The first century, the label evildoers brought to mind many of the specific accusations that the, the pagans, the lost world would say about them. The things that, that we don't really hear too much anymore, but we are aware of. That they re rebelled against the Roman government. They practiced cannibalism. They engaged in incest, opposed slavery, practiced atheism by not worshiping Caesar or the Roman gods. The, the very thing in which they slandered, the things that typically we get slandered uh, by, uh, by outsiders is, is usually because someone who claims to be a Christian is not really a Christian. They, they, they are a, a wolf, right? And, and so what we see is the world sees this well-known Christian falling, right, and they say, ah, oh, well, it's, they're no different. They're no different than, than the world. They are just like the world. And, and unfortunately, in a lot of ways, we are. We are. But we're called to be so much, so much better than that. The very thing in which they slander, believers must live the opposite way. Providing unbelievers wrong and demonstrating the validity of the gospel. Again, Matthew 5, 16. That our light may shine so that others may see Jesus Christ. Right? It's not about you, and it's not about me. It's about our love for our Heavenly Father. It's about what He has done for you and for me, that He is alive and well inside His believers, inside His children. On the stage of such credibility, personal witness has an impact. 
observing the exceptional life of such believers. Some will believe, some will be saved and glorify God in the day of visitation. This idea of the day of visitation really is, is the idea of, of, a, uh, of Jesus saving one another, all right, uh, saving uh, the lost world. The apostle used this expression to show that because of an observation of Christian virtue and good works in the lives of believers, some would be privileged to glorify God when he also visited them with salvation. How is it that these believers were able to be able to point people to Jesus Christ, even though that they had lost everything? They had lost their home, all of their possessions. They had lost where they lived. And they had lost everything, and yet they still would be able to point people to Jesus Christ. It is in those moments when we are at our worst that people look at us the most. They look at us the most, and they say, Are you truly different? I'm closing with this. A 20th century example of how godly living can influence the salvation of unbelievers comes from the events in a Japanese prisoner of war camp in the Philippines during World War II. American missionaries, Herb and Ruth Klingen, and their young son were prisoners of the Japanese for three years. Herb's diary told how his family's captors tortured, murdered, and starved to death many of the camp's other inmates. The prisoners particularly hated and feared the camp, Commandant Konishi. Divine intervention spared the Klingons and others in February of 1945 when Allied forces liberated the prison camp. That prevented the Commandant from carrying out his plan of shooting and killing all surviving prisoners. Years later, the Klingons learned that uh, Konishi had been found working as a groundskeeper at a Manila golf course. He was put on trial for his war crimes and hanged. Before his execution, he professed, professed conversion to Christianity, saying he had been deeply affected by the testimony of the Christian missionaries he had persecuted. Effective evangelism flows from the power of a righteous life. Let's pray together. Father, even in the midst of pain and turmoil and confusion, God, we ask that you would use us in a mighty way. That our lives would demonstrate a relationship with the creator of the world. God, I ask that you would be in this place tonight, God, as we continue serving you and as we bring up a, a wonderful opportunity to learn more about who you are, to grow deeper in knowledge of who you are, what you have done, and how we may take that knowledge and share the good news of who you are. That you would be glorified not only in this place as we meet together, but God, that you would be glorified out in this world. That people would see us and see something different about us. That we would glorify your name from the mountaintops and that we would glorify your name all the louder in the midst of the valleys. For it is you and you alone who is the author of peace and grace and abundance. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.